Whenever I've heard the name Guillermo del Toro, I've mentally associated it with what I've heard said by others. He makes fantasy come to life. He's great with horror. He's an inspiration. And I haven't had much reason to dispute those claims. After all, the man wrote a series of novels that the FX network spun a vampire plague series out of. And last we heard of Guillermo, he was working on the new Silent Hills game which had a demo that will stand for quite a few more years as the most immersive and horrifying one-shot game in existence. He also directed Hellboy and its sequel as well as Blade 2, so it only does make sense to attribute him to the horror genre. Until you actually sit down and watch his films. Guillermo has made three major films based off of his own original writing before Crimson Peak. The Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth, and Pacific Rim. Pan's Labyrinth, as many will remember, set Guillermo up as more of a household name in North America, attributing him to more than just superhero adaptations. Pacific Rim, by Guillermo's own admission, was his moment just having a lot of fun with a budget. The Devil's Backbone is more familiar to the idea of Pan's Labyrinth and more in tune with its themes. In order to prepare for Crimson Peak's viewing, I watched The Devil's Backbone and Pan's Labyrinth back to back earlier this week, making sure I could familiarize myself with Guillermo as a storyteller and director before coming to judgment. I wanted to experience this much talked about fantasy horror professional's prowess before I went into what seemed like his bloodiest film to date. What I realized very, very quickly while watching The Devil's Backbone and Pan's Labyrinth is that Guillermo del Toro is not a horror director. He doesn't mean to really scare you with his creations and in sequences that are probably scary for those characters, it's very difficult to feel afraid yourself. What Guillermo does best is create a very visually appealing film with fantasy elements, and in certain moments, those elements can be scary, given the right lighting, buildup, moment, and portrayal. But most of the time, things that should frighten us on scene just don't, even when it seems the film is really trying to make it happen. Going into Crimson Peak, I wondered if Guillermo was going to up the ante and show us what he could really do with a much more horror-based premise. And again, I learned that the expectations built around the man and his work aren't close to the reality. I've heard it said by many reviewers, critics, and casual viewers that too many films now are marketed to provide the wrong impression, either through their trailers or their online campaigns. This is very much the case for Crimson Peak, which gave a lot of haunted house vibes and didn't deliver nearly strong enough in that department to justify the advertising. Those moments in which the film was billed as a gothic romance aren't even right either. There's not enough romance or love between characters in the film to label it as such. Ultimately, both the horror movie advertising and gothic romance billing resulted in half-truths, and I'm not quite sure I can even call either approach halfway met. Let's establish this though, first and foremost. On a visual scale, this is one of the most stunning, beautiful, award-worthy films you will ever see. The set, costuming, and ghost depictions have been given so much power and raised to such a quality you'll swear the entire visual sector behind production bled to make this happen. Crimson Peak is a feast for the eyes in every single shot, and none of it is overdone. It's just right, and even then, it still has a bit more quality added in because it cares that much. Whoever came into this film as art director wanted to craft a masterpiece and you can see they fought tooth, nail, and bone to make it happen. Where their specific job function lied, anyway. Crimson Peak's absolute beauty, while truly remarkable, is also its biggest flaw. The film's other factors are completely outperformed by the set. The only consistent displays of effort and strength outside the visuals come from Tom Hiddleston and Jessica Chastain who play Thomas and Lucille Sharp. As you watch the film, you do not see Tom Hiddleston. This is not Loki of Asgard from the Marvel Universe trying on a different role. Tom Hiddleston completely disappears into Thomas Sharp and you don't think about Loki for a second. Jessica Chastain, who plays his sister Lucille, is actually the most intense and intriguing character in the whole film and completely holds her own with Hiddleston. In the end, Jessica's performance is stronger than Tom's only due to the kind of freedom she's given as a character and the kind of moments she's granted for screen time. The only real problem with their performances is actually out of their control entirely. The arrival of their breakout shining moments in the film just so happened to be mixed with every single other breakout shining moment in the film, all at once after testing your patience as a viewer for far too long in order to earn what you thought you'd be seeing from the start. 
Crimson Peak has a major, major issue, and it's the same kind of problem I detected while watching The Devil's Backbone. As the movie goes along, it carries a decent amount of interest in average story building, but only achieves the average success. You watch characters interact and events unfold with what can be considered a very normal level of engagement. There are a few points of immersion where you actually feel absorbed and they don't last nearly long enough. Once in a while, characters will become more fleshed out and alive than you expected but lose what interest they just stirred in you as some other thing happens. And you keep expecting characterization to go deeper to give you a real reason to become immersed and engaged. And it's a crushing disappointment when you see constant missed opportunities to give us those moments. Then, after you've waited and waited and hoped for a payoff, suddenly things become truly interesting and it's as if a whole new writer and director stepped into the room. All of a sudden, you care. You really care and you're actively engaged and excited about what's happening. You get precisely what the trailers had promised you. After a lot of drawn out watching and waiting. In The Devil's Backbone, a turn of this nature occurred at the very beginning of the third act and made for a much better overall film. It came a little late, but it came early enough to save the entire piece. In Crimson Peak, the turn came at what could only be the last 20 minutes of a two-hour movie. Now, when the quality spike does come in Crimson Peak, it hits hard and it hits fast. You realize that this film does have a payoff, a great payoff. But after it's done in the credits roll, you ask yourself why all that power of good writing all that brilliant character performance, all of that effort and quality and all aspects of film didn't exist anywhere before the final scenes. It's not a problem of the climax being the high point of the film because that's standard storytelling. It's an issue of having no rising action or reason to care until that climax. The climax was the only real high point of the film, the only moment that lives up to the hype surrounding this movie's release. Now, it may sound as if the entire film was a disappointment by my saying that, but it's actually not the case. Crimson Peak, all the way through until the big finale, is a good film. Not great, but certainly good. It has a nice flow, it has decent characters, it has the usual fairy tale cinematography and directing we've seen with Guillermo. But if the ending wasn't so spectacular, the film would be a solid 3 out of 5, with most of the credit going to the visuals. The really major disappointment comes in the form of seeing a film like this was overhyped when you know its creator absolutely had it in him to live up to that hype instead of succeeding just 20% of the way. It truly doesn't help that the villain of the story is given away in the first act before they commit any evil actions or that we see the ghosts and scares well ahead of our main character. And I'll add this being as we're all here to know about the horror aspect. The ghosts weren't handled well enough to be frightening in the majority of their appearances. This movie fails as a horror piece all the way up to its ending, and besides the mishandling of the aspects meant to be scary, there were a lot of really odd moments where I wondered why a line of dialogue was written or why a certain action was taken that just didn't seem right. In one instance I'm never going to forget, our main character hears a ghost in the hallway coming closer and then is violently pulled to the floor by the phantom. She gets up, visibly terrified, and we see her dog is right behind her on a chair, looking perfectly comfortable and wide awake as this has just happened. The dog had detected ghostly activity by this point, barking late into the night before phantom appearance, and in this instance of its beloved caretaker being knocked to the floor directly in front of it, the dog just sits there, watching. No reaction. Oversights, inconsistencies, and bad dialogue choices are rare though. I believe I was more susceptible to spotting them in Crimson Peak because of how in tune I became looking for something to genuinely intrigue me. So many opportunities to properly tie us to these characters as more than story vessels existed, but almost none were taken. It's all very well acted and directed, but the actors can only work with the writing they're given, and that writing is sorely lacking in several parts up until the final 20 minutes. Again, it's like a brand new writer and director stepped into the room, bringing a massive amount of quality, effort, and artistic understanding with them. The ending really is the true meat of the film. You get the horror element, you get the deeper characterization, you get pretty much everything you've been hoping would come up before that point. If the entire film had the power of its last 20 minutes, it would be well above a 4 out of 5 for sure. But because only the ending is worthy of that rating and the rest of the film is a 3.5 at best with the half point resting on the strength of two actors and incredible visuals, Crimson Peak only just hits a 4 out of 5, barely coming out over the entryway for that fourth level. If you're looking for a real month of Halloween film, Crimson Peak is not going to do it for you. If you are, however, a major fan of captivating visuals and film and love 19th century pieces, 
definitely go for it. Just be warned that it's not really scary, and while it is somewhat billed as a romance, it's not going to do much in that department for you either. If you're a fan of Tom Hiddleston, he will make this a very good experience for you in the form of Thomas Sharp, and Jessica Chastain becomes very exciting in the climax. But as far as Guillermo's original films go, Pan's Labyrinth still stands much higher than this latest offering. Don't mistake my disappointment for an overall sense that this film was bad, however. My disappointment stems from getting a much weaker experience than I was promised by trailers, advertising, and the usual media hype. If you are a fan of Guillermo's work in general, definitely go see this film. You will be getting a lot more of the same. Just know that specific portions of his knockout performance come much, much later than expected. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening. If you enjoyed this review, feel free to click the like button and subscribe for future videos on new movies in the horror and thriller genre. Don't despair yet, friends. There are good things coming to theaters in the following months. For instance, the director and writer for one of my all-time favorites, Trick or Treat, is coming out with a movie called Krampus this Christmas season, and I know of a certain movie in January based on several true stories I'm excited about. Once again, I'm Nick Nocturne, and like another movie with a misleading ad campaign, I'll be seeing you again real soon. Sleep tight.